Uh, well done, everybody, on, uh, on coming to the last session. I promise it's going to be full of excitement. I, I'm a, a project strategist. Uh, those of you who have worked on projects know that there's no such thing as a project strategist. Um, but I've been in the software business since the 1980s, starting off as a programmer and working my way up to an architect. And uh, I guess I should be showing. Yeah, OK. Whatever that is. That's what I am. So when I got interviewed by the, uh, by the Bureau of Meteorology to take over this job, I said to them, look, you know, I don't have any GIS skills. And they said, nah, it's not that that we want. We want a bit of the peripheral stuff that you know. So here I am, project strategist. So now the current Australian government, they've got a problem. It's a conservative government. They call themselves the Liberal Party. God knows why, but anyway, it's a conservative government. And so they get their support from two major uh, power blocks. That will be the rural people out in the farms and the, uh, and the mining companies. So the question is, what happens when mining companies and rural people disagree? And over the question of coal seam gas, they really do disagree. So what they've decided is that they would consult the scientists because, you know, if you ask sci scientists about the truth, what is it, and they tell you, then everybody's just going to believe them, right? Yeah. Anyway, so they launched this bioregional assessments program. I'm just going to put this slide up there and let you guys digest it for a second or two, because this is really what, what it's all about. So as a project strategist, I believe the right way to envisage a project is a, a purposeful learning system. So I, I, I'm sure you guys all love those shots of Elon Musk's retrieving the, the rocket as it didn't land very well the first time. That's what it's all about. You get in there, you fail, you adapt, you do it better. One of the problems with this style, though, is that it's a, it is at odds with the way that projects are funded, and it's also difficult to adjust people's behavior towards that goal. It appears that most normal people like to know what's going to happen. They like to have a few stages that they have to go through and then finally reach their, their objective. And it also, we have discovered that scientists are very similar to normal people. So they saw things the same way. But happily, they're all very, very nice, and they were happy to go on the journey that, that, that has been the Bioregional Assessments Program. So I'm going to tell you what the challenges were. And then, um, and then how we dealt with those challenges. I should point out that it's very much a live project. There's still a lot going on, so you know we're learning as we go. Every now and then that rocket hits that barge and boom, everything falls over. But okay, so the first problem was the multiplicity of sources. So we've gathered so we've got we've gathered data from a variety of places, mining companies, state government authorities, federal government authorities, environmental agencies, universities, you name it. And these guys had clearly two objectives in gathering their data. The first was to put together the best data set they possibly could. And the second was to use formats that nobody else was using or nobody had even heard of. Oh, yeah, OK, so it probably wasn't really their objective, but that's what it felt like. The second one was a question of provenance. So all of this data was sort of differentially licensed, differentially owned, and we had to absorb that and make sure that everything that we took in did not lose track of where it came from. So if a scientist used two pieces of data and came up with a third, we had to capture that piece of data, we had to capture 
the metadata about that piece of data. Then we had to capture the parents of that piece of data. We had to capture the metadata for the parents of that piece of data and the links between the children and the parents. And believe it or not, we had to capture the metadata for the links between the parents and the children. So that was the second challenge. I've got to stop doing that. <laughs> okay, the third challenge then was trying to get a single approach for all of the bioregions. So we had geologists and hydrogeologists and ecologists and various other professionals, over 200 of them, all of whom were absolute leaders in their fields. So having one PhD was the, was the entry level requirement. Many of them had more than one PhD. And it's very, very difficult to tell these people what they need to do because they really do know what they need to do better than anybody else. So what we had to do was we had to get them to agree with each other because obviously we, we're not going to tell them what to do. And uh, that is, turns out to be one of the biggest challenges of the lot is getting scientists to agree. So what we learned, well, we all know that scientists agree on one thing, which is about climate change, but they don't agree on anything else. And we know this from our experience. The next thing is the differential <clears throat> expertise. So we are IT people and scientists are kind of IT people. So I'd like to illustrate this problem by taking you through a phenomenon called the Dunning-Kruger effect. Has anybody heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect? So the, the Dunning-Kruger effect basically says that a person's perceptions about what they know are actually different to their experience. So if you start, you get into a field you have great confidence, it's right up here. I have great confidence in what, what I know in the early years of, of doing it. Your experience, though, is right down here somewhere. Then as you go, you realize, whoa, this is a lot more complicated than I thought. And your confidence drops right off as your experience goes up. So your experience is now higher than your confidence was. And then you gradually get up. And here's a really interesting thing is that when you're very experienced, you never, ever reach the confidence levels you had when you just started at something. So just imagine what it was like for me, the software guy. Because every one of those scientists had dabbled in IT. So they knew more than I did, clearly. Because I was not, absolutely not sure about what I knew. There was a flip side to that, because I was new to GIS. So I knew everything. Yeah. I say it flippantly, but it was, it was a problem. Trying to know when to let go, when to learn, when to teach. The next problem was the fact that we were breaking new ground. So Chris Hadfield talked about, when, when somebody asked him a question, he talked about uh, how easy it would be or, or, or when we would eventually get to Mars. And I thought, yeah, okay, he answered that very well. It's very complicated. But at least with the Mars thing, it's a fixed thing. You are going to try to get to Mars. For us, our objective just kept moving around because the scientists really didn't know exactly where everything was going to land. So we couldn't build for the landing place. Normally when you do enterprise software, somebody has the task in their head what the, that the software has to perform. And it's a matter of how close we can iterate until we get to that point. So much for the challenges. So as the project strategist, first thing to do is set the, the strategic objective. So one day I was sitting with the scientists and I tried to explain to them one of the uh, one of the user interface guidelines we use when we develop software, which is called the pit of success. And the way it works is that what you try to do is if the users cut every corner they can possibly think of, ignore any screen cues, just push the first button they see, try not to fill in anything and, and walk away, that they've done it right. So that's the pit of success. You actually fall into it. It's not like a mountain that you have to climb to get it right. You just, you just do it right. 
So that became what we were going to try to get right. So another thing that comes out of the strategy textbooks, when you teach organizations about strategy, what you try to do is, is you get them to focus on capability. And you get them to look at the capabilities they have that deliver the most flexibility and the most power. And power in the world, in the world of strategy means the ability to influence future events. So you want to try to get something um, as, as flexible and as powerful as you can. So at, at that point, we were looking around for what our technology stack was going to be, and we had a few people working with us. Brett was one of them. And we came up with a combination of PostGIS as the database system, FME, and Amazon Web Services. I thought that uh, FME would, would help us to deal with different formats in different locations, all of those crazy formats that the mining companies and everybody used. Amazon Web Services would al al allow us to scale the system up as, as big as it needed to be. And then, it, then PostGIS would, would provide that steady center that we could put everything in and have a properly normalized database with all of the right constraints in place and that. So we, <clears throat> we hope to use this to quickly turn around the thoughts of the scientists because the scientists were all thinking in different ways and they're different experts. And we thought if we could get, if we could capture it and put it out there again really rapidly in very fast iterations, then that we could start to get some traction on, on where everything was going to go. But we had to deal with the data ma management and provenance issue. And this really became a problem because al although we wanted to do these really fast iterations, because they were so concerned about provenance, they had set up this process that every data set had to be registered. And it took days. To, to, get a, to get it registered and then checked by the data oversight committee and all that sort of stuff. It took absolute days for them to do it. So our ability to turn it around meant nothing because we couldn't get data into the system. So we used, we turned to Amazon. Amazon's got this amazing NoSQL database solution called uh, DynamoDB. We used that. We used S3 for them to load all, the, all of the data sets onto. Um, and then we used FME to get the information off the S3 and to grab the, the metadata off the DynamoDB and then it actually embedded the metadata into those database tables so that for every row, every line of the database is a one that you may not be able to read, all of those things with underscore with the provenance information. So we were saying where the data set was derived from and the date that we got it and who authored it and all of that sort of stuff. The next trick we used was another software development trick, which is the use of a framework. So when you're working on a big software team, maybe 20 or more people, uh, it's, a common, it's a common thing to not have any control over the periphery. So the developers at, who, who are working on the edges of the system, you don't really have a good view on how they're solving the problems they need to. So what you do is you set up a framework. Uh, you get two or three core developers and you just work on a very, very good framework which mainly consists of classes and APIs and then you get the other developers to consume those classes and APIs so that everybody's basically using the same language to do it. So we did our version of that which was we had a very tightly normalized database. We put constraints into the database including constraints uh, about provenance ensuring that every single table had um, provenance and um, and there we had it that was that was one amazingly beautiful technology stack that could just about do anything and then we came to the problem the Dunning-Kruger problem the who who can do what problem which was the scientists were not giving us any data they 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 were holding on to it themselves. They were keeping it on their desktops. And they were doing the gridding work themselves. Now, the gridding work, basically, the way the scientists had decided to go about it was they would chop the whole of Australia into one kilometer grid cells, or at least the, the whole of the bioregion area, and then work out what's happening within that, that grid cell. So what are the fauna, the flora, the geological formations, and everything. So all of the data sets had to be crunched into these grid cells. 
And that turned out to be a big job. But it was a big job that the scientists didn't want to give us. So I decided that what we needed to do was hire ourselves a, a person that they could relate to, somebody from the geospatial world who wasn't me and who had the right credentials. So I found this guy who, on his business card, he called himself the Dark Spatial Lord. And I thought, oh, that is absolutely perfect. He's calling himself the Dark Spatial Lord. So I started to put the word out amongst all the scientists that, ah, don't worry, in a couple of weeks, we've got ourselves the Dark Spatial Lord, and he's going to be on the IT team. You've got nothing to worry about. And I was extremely gratified when, just two or three days before he joined, joined us, one of the science team phoned up and said, when does the spatial overlord arrive? <laughs> I thought, overlord, yes, even better. So anyway, he arrived, and um, yeah, it still didn't really work. We still didn't get the throughput. They were still holding on to their data. So, they, uh, so we sort of sat around and talked a lot and admired our technology stack. And then one day... They were trying to cr crunch something like two million data sets. And they came through to us and they said, look, we can't do this. This keeps crashing our desktops. So we very gleefully cranked up our 64 CPU, 250, 256 gigabyte machine, and we started crunching this data. And three days later, we had gridded their data. And it was wrong. So we did it again. And it was wrong again. But we did get it right. <clears throat> so, let's see where we are. We hired the dark spatial law. So we had the immutable database. What we then did was we. Um, we invited, we, put, we moved all of the data into the immutable database and then we invited uh, the scientists to play around with views on that database, to use materialized views. So that, that basically means they could create their own tables on the database, but because they were materialized views, no data could get in there. They had to read the, the, the data from the, from the underlying tables. So there you have it, the, the normalized database, all fed in by um, FME. It was the only way that you could get to it. And then on the right-hand side there, there's all of the views that the scientists created. And at last count, they've created 975 views on our, uh, on our database. But they're going well, and they're getting the results they want, and it's all excellent. So the strategic approach then, to iterate fast, give the experts something to look at, to work on, to push against. One last trick we had up our sleeves. We used FME to grab the, the information off the geo server, which is where they were looking at all their views, and replicate it out into their, onto their SharePoint server so that they could actually see it in HTML form on their, um, on their uh, SharePoint workspaces. So what did we have then? Well, we had a situation where the scientists could spend time converting data sets they could spend time developing a query that yields the outputs they need. And they could spend time registering the data set, and that was a lot of time, three or four days per data set. Or they could grab a working tested data set from the list on their desktop. So that there was the pit of success, easy way, and they could go from there. I've got nothing to say to this slide. <laughs> and that's it. Thanks very much, Trevor. That was really an intriguing story. <laughs> uh, really nice that you took us along that journey to make that happen. I think we have a couple minutes left.
The, the process. You mentioned to me earlier there was a proof of concept. Did, how did you get them to give you the time to make uh, the proof uh, of concept? What, what I, what, okay, what I was talking to you about before was that we've had this FME license at the Bureau of Meteorology for the last, I don't know, five years? And it's never been used before. Well, I'll tell you one thing, though, because, the, because our team has been using FME heavily and we all work inside the Bureau, so we've been using FME heavily and the, the rest of the Bureau has just turned their back on it. They're not, they're not interested. A few days ago, they learned they were losing their Oracle licenses on some of their machines. And they came to us in a complete panic and they said, we're going to lose our, we've got all of this data on these Oracle machines. Is there anything you can do to help? Uh, yeah, yeah, we can help. <laughs> Oh, man, I'm going to be so boring here. I'm going to say attribute manager. Yeah. Oh, no, no, attribute exploder. Attribute exploder. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So I came back and you got, hey, I've got an attribute exploder. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks for sticking.